I am convinced that many in the church today have discounted to our own uh, demise the power of grace in a believer's life. I have uh, experienced God flooding me personally with his grace, which has given me um, the drive and determination to overcome the obstacles that the enemy uh, tries to place in our lives. And so today I want to talk about how to draw from God's grace, how to draw from God's grace. And let me say this, in my study time, uh, I was going over the book of Acts again, and I would invite you all to uh, do a fresh study on the book of Acts from chapters one really through chapter 13, up to chapter 13, it deals with the church and the Apostle Paul and his ministry and the struggles that he dealt with uh, trying to establish the church um, to bring people into the kingdom of God. But then from 13 on, it really deals with Paul the Apostle Paul and his journey, uh, starting at nine, how God converted him on a road, uh, Damascus, and how he was blinded by the light. There's a song he used to sing, Blinded by the Light. Uh, and his conversion and his journey and how God uh, moves him, works in his life to get him where he needs to be. Uh, Paul's headquarters was Antioch, which was some 500 plus miles from Jerusalem. Uh, and uh, it's amazing how if you look at Paul's ministry, how in the 13th chapter he was uh, called by the Holy Spirit along with Barnabas uh, to be separated and to be sent out in a, uh, as an evangelist, so to speak, and to go and to spread the gospel of the kingdom, the way, uh, the news that Jesus was the Messiah. It is absolutely amazing how he would go from one synagogue to the next and he would get there and he would be given the invitation to speak and as he spoke he would introduce the message and he preached Jesus as the Christ, the Messiah. And uh, initially, there was, there was acceptance initially, but it seemed like just a few days after he was initially received with gladness, trouble was somehow stirred up. And the trouble always led to him having to flee uh, that place. And it, it's amazing how from one place to the next, the pattern stays the same. He would go in, he would preach the word, there would be an acceptance, and then the Jews would be stirred up, and then they would come and, and come against his message, his preaching, and they would have to run to another city. This happens continuously. And uh, we go over to the 18th chapter of 
of uh, Acts, and I'm just trying to give you some perspective. Uh, we go over to the 18th chapter of Acts, and he lands in this place called Corinth, and he finds Aquila and Priscilla, who are also tradesmen like he is. He was a tent maker. And they, they get in league together, and he initially goes into the synagogue, and he preaches, and there's initial acceptance, and then the stirring up of the people, and then they are thrown out, basically. And Paul kicks the dust off his feet and says, it was necessary that I would come to you, but now I'm going to the Gentiles. And so he goes next door, so to speak. And he starts teaching and preaching, and the Gentiles celebrate. And after all his labor, after all his, his, this pattern that wears him out, now you listen to this. He finally gets to Antioch, or excuse me, uh, Corinth, and there in a night vision. I, I thought about this. There in a night vision, Jesus speaks to him. And basically says, Paul, uh, I've seen your labor, and I want you to know you don't have to worry about the pattern happening here in Corinth. Uh, I'm with you. You just keep teaching and preaching the word because I have much people in this city. And the Bible says that for a year and a half. Isn't that wonderful? He finally finds some rest, but after that year and a half, the government changes and we go back to that same pattern where Paul has to leave and he's left there, uh, Aquila and Priscilla, and then they find Apollos and you know the rest of the story. Paul was the, uh, the founder of the church at Corinth. He founded it upon apostolic authority. He was given that commission to go out in Acts chapter 13, and so those people were connected to him. He spent a year and a half laboring there, uh, dealing with them in prayer, and in tears, teaching them. And I thought about that, how preachers can give their life for people to uh, pray and constantly battle against the forces of darkness to try to help folk get a leg up. And then uh, after he leaves, uh, of course, he's writing letters because of the condition that the church soon and very soon falls into. Y'all hear what I'm saying? And then... Uh, you know, 1 Corinthians and then 2 Corinthians. And, of course, there's a letter that was kind of lost. That's what we believe, dealing with fornication and adultery. But anyway, uh, in 2 Corinthians, and that's where I want to take you at today, after being there for a year and a half and teaching and preaching and, and giving his life and, of course, having to be removed because of the oppression that came and leaving the church in the hands of Apollos and the church continually to grow and yet having issues. Uh, the church, because it has allowed other than legitimate voices to come in and to speak to them, turns sour on Paul, so to speak. And they began to question uh, his credibility and his apostleship. And of course, Paul in 2 Corinthians defends uh, the reason why he was not able to initially come to them. And it was because of persecution. It was because he was on, his, on, on the run for his life. And then, uh, of course, uh, he defends his ap uh, apostolic calling uh, and he confirms it with uh, signs and wonders that were in his ministry. And let me say this, everybody that says they are certain things don't mean they really are. Say amen. Just because somebody comes to you and tells you they are an apostle or 
a prophet, they have to have the evidence that is associated with those types of ministries. Amen. Say amen, somebody. Amen. And if you'll look for the evidence or the sign, you won't get deceived. Say amen, somebody. And so he goes on to argue his apostleship. And it's just, it's amazing to me how he had done so much, and yet the people had turned sour on him. And I'm sure that hurt him in his heart. And yet he was pleading with them in this second letter uh, to not disregard him and to embrace him and to follow the teachings that he had set forth as the foundation. You remember he said in 1 Corinthians, he said, uh, one waters, one plants, another waters, but God gives the increase. And then he goes on to say that I have laid the foundation. And this is talking to Corinth. He said, but another comes and waters. And he was really talking about Apollos, who uh, received his conversion through uh, Aquila and Priscilla. And, uh, and he was giving them warning. He said, be careful who you let come in and speak to you, because not everybody is of the faith, is of the way. I know I'm rambling, but I'm going to get where I'm needing to go, amen. He, uh, he deals with this, this rejection, and it's sad that he has to defend his apostleship and his authority within that church. Uh, he talks about all the suffering that he has went through as, uh, as an apostle to, to benefit humanity. And I thought about that, and I said to myself, uh, I know I've been hard on Paul, amen. I've been hard on him, but I, I had a, a new appreciation. And the, the appreciation that I have is that he did his best and he, he gave his life to the struggle. And uh, anybody that's willing to give their life to a struggle, to the point where they are willing to die for the struggle, you have to give that person credit, amen. amen. And so, Paul talks about being stoned, being adrift, being hungry, and all that stuff for the furtherance of the gospel. And I said to myself, my God from Zion, would we be willing to be in such hazard conditions? Today, if we don't have a comfortable building with air conditioner and light and padded pews, will we even be here, amen? And I thought about that, how Paul would go from place to place. Sometimes he would have to worship under a tree and bring people into the kingdom in dire situations, in jail cells. Y'all hear what I'm saying? Everywhere he went, he was about the message. And yet, everywhere he went, it was always opposition. Seemed like he just always dogged his steps. Seemed like every place he went, he could not get away from the pattern where he would have success and then immediately after, there would be something that would come in. And I thought about the analogy how in our lives, we have success, we have moments of success. And it seemed like, I mean, the rejoicing and the joy and the excitement that happens to us as we journey walking hand in hand with God is wonderful. But it just seemed like, and maybe this is me, I don't know, but soon after the joy, there's always something that comes along to challenge us, to, to hit us, to knock us. And we are soon again in a struggle, having to try to overcome, to endure, to overcome what comes our way. Just like Paul in his ministry, 
there was always something there that, that would always kind of bring him back down to earth. Y'all understand what I'm saying? And realize, well, we haven't, we haven't made it to glory yet. We're still in this struggle. In the 12th chapter, Paul talks about this. He says, yes, I have received revelation, and I, I get revelation from God. And he talked about 14 years ago how he had been caught up to the third heaven, paradise. If you want to compare who, who's really close with God and who really has uh, an anointing from God, he, he goes on to say, I, yeah, I've been caught up and I've went to the third paradise. Uh, if you are impressed by that kind of stuff. And he said, I heard stuff I shouldn't have never heard. Stuff that's unlawful for me to even repeat. Uh, he said, if I'm going to glory, I would glory in this, something like that. But he says, to keep me from being lifted up in pride that was given unto me. And this is what he says. A thorn in the flesh, uh, the messenger of Satan. Let me, let me read verse 7. Because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself. Verse 7, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Now, I have real serious doubts that this thorn in the flesh came from God. I would not suggest that in the least bit because Paul tells us what the thorn was. He said it was a messenger from Satan and the word messenger simply means angel. There was a satanic angel that was assigned to him to keep him from, from moving forward and exalting himself to the point where he was operating in his ministry unhindered and unchecked. Think about it. What could we do if we didn't have opposition always coming into our lives to hold us back, to keep us from going forward? Just think about it. If we could get past the opposition the hindrances, those things that come into our lives. I mean, most of us will be a whole lot further down the road if we didn't have to stop and deal with the hindrances and the oppositions. But that's a part of life. Amen. That's a part of being human. That's a part of existing in this flesh, which uh, really brought me to my first point on last week, and that is that all of us, every last one of us, no matter how spiritual we think we are, we all are going to find places where things come into our lives, sometimes no fault of our own, and then other times is because of us that hinder us that hurt us, that are trying to discourage us. I don't care who you are. And please listen to me. No one is exempt from having to deal with these issues. I mean, no matter how close you get to God, everybody got to come down to the valley. We can have mountaintop experiences where we think we're getting ready to get raptured up. But the truth is... We coming back down to the, the valley. And there in the valley, that's where we deal with the muck and the mire. And, 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 and yet God is with us in the valley, amen. While we are in the muck and the mire, God is still with us. He hasn't left us. It's just that we don't realize his glory and his presence. And yet, sometimes when we're in the muck and the mire, it is there that God does his greatest work in our lives. Somebody needs to say amen. I know when I'm struggling, God is with me. I know when I'm hurting, God is with me. I don't want to hurt. I want to feel good. I, I don't want to have to struggle, but guess what? 
the human experience it says sometimes we struggle. And I have to realize always while we are struggling, while we are in the midst of it, God is still there. He doesn't leave us. And because we can't see his bright shining glory in our circumstances, doesn't mean he's not leading us through it. Say amen. Even in the darkness, even when we are low and in despair, God is still with us. Thank you, Father. He's there to strengthen us. He gives us grace. Hallelujah. That word grace, what a powerful word. Not too long ago, I was sitting in my office. I was struggling. I was struggling. And I was in despair over some, some issues. Sometimes it doesn't have to be your own personal issue. Sometimes it's other people's issues that affect you. Paul talked about the weight of the ministry being upon him. You don't understand sometimes when you love people and you hear about something that's hurting them, how that can affect you. And I was sitting there and I said, Lord, and I was talking to God and I said, God, you got to do something. And, and I was feeling hopeless. Have you ever been there? Have you ever been there? I know we're not supposed to, right? But I've been there. And then I remembered his grace. His grace is sufficient. And I said to myself, but, but God, help me access. Help me access. I said, I need your grace. Help me access. And then he said, I'm going to remind you how you receive everything from me. You receive it by faith. Grace that we need in a moment, we got to receive what? By, by faith. Why? Because it's a promise. When Paul was talking about his struggle, his thorn, here go Paul. I asked the Lord what? Three times. Have you ever prayed? <laughs> Come on, y'all. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Have you ever cried out? Lord, you got to do something here. I need your help. And you don't hear nothing. And that's when we got to be reminded. Because we don't hear nothing don't mean we don't have nothing. <laughs> well, I wish y'all would hear me today. Because we don't hear nothing doesn't mean we don't have nothing. See, there is grace. It's always, say always. It's always available. Grace is always there. And sometimes we can't see our way. Because we're in such a dark situation, hopeless, and yet we always have, because the words come back to us, my grace is sufficient for you, my grace will help you get through this and overcome it, and you don't have to despair, get out of the pity party. Stop waddling in the mess and let grace stand you up and lift you up and cheer you up. Say amen. And so I thought about it and I said, how do I access it? I know it's there. How do I access it? I know it's there. And you can have a whole lot available to you, but if you don't have the combination, if you don't have the key to get into it, then it's on the other side of the wall and there's a door, but you got to have the lock. And so I'm just trying to share with you, yes, grace is sufficient, but you got to know how to access it. 
And so here's what I want to say. Number one, write this down. Write this down. Every promise that we get from God, including this one, uh, please hear me. Every promise, we have to first understand uh, is received by faith. Faith and confession. As I was sitting there, I said, I know I got grace, but I'm not, I'm not experiencing the power of his grace, and I need to access it. And he, he reminded me, he said, it's a promise, son. Grace is a promise. I said, if it's a promise, then it's just like every other promise. Did y'all hear me? It's just like every other promise. And you got to receive it by faith. Well, how do you receive it by faith? And then he, he, he brought me to the woman with the issue. Isn't that amazing? He said, remember the woman with the issue. The issue of blood. He said, remember her? She heard. And then she said, I remember what I heard when he said, my grace is sufficient. Therefore, in order for me to access it, I got to say it. I got to start out by saying it. When the woman said, I know if I touch the hem of his garment, I'll be made whole. She said it before she had it. But that's called faith. She said, if I can get to him and reach out and touch him. And she said, I'm not letting nothing stop me. I'm going to get through the press. But she heard Faith coming by what? I can't hear y'all. Faith coming by what? Hearing. You got to hear me when I say his grace is sufficient to help you overcome the hindrances that come into your life. You don't have to lay down to them. You don't have to be defeated by them. His grace, say his grace. It's sufficient. And the way you access is, is, is the same way the woman with the issue of blood access because it's a promise. When he says, my grace is sufficient for thee. For when you're weak, my grace can make you strong. That's what he was really saying. So as a promise, I got to confess it. So write down number one, you got to confess it. His grace. Say, I have, I have, I have his grace. I was sitting at my desk and I said to my, I said, I got to say this thing. I got to stop allowing what is pressing against me. And, and you listen to me. Care. Worry and care. Care and worry will destroy you. You, you, you get a hold of some worry and you start chewing on some worry, worry will kill you. Do y'all hear me? And you got to cast all your worry. But you know what? It takes grace to cast worry on the Lord because we'll try to figure that thing out. That's the human in us. And he's saying, just cast it on me. Cast your care on me. But in order to do that, it takes grace. So you got to start with what? Grace. So you can access the other stuff that's being made available to you. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? So I said, grace, I have it. I start confessing it. I said, grace is mine. Grace is mine. I have grace. I've been given grace. I have the grace. God, I got your grace. It comes through my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm access. I believe I have it. And then the second thing is you got to believe you receive it when you say it. And so what I had to say to myself and what we have to say to ourselves while we're dealing with the hindrances and discouragement and the things that come to knock us off our 
feet, just like they came in Paul's life. You got to say, I got grace now to overcome it. I got the grace of God to what? Overcome the hindrances and the obstacles in my life. You got to sit there and you got to tell yourself, I have his grace. I have, say I have his grace. And then listen, when that woman reached out and touched by faith, she knew she was healed. She felt it in her own body. Now, what did that? God's power. But what in Enabled her in her weakened condition to press. Oh, y'all, she's weak. This woman got blood for 12 years in a weakened condition, and yet there was enough grace of God to help her stand up and get in the press and get her complete. See, grace will help you endure it. Until you overcome, y'all didn't catch that, did you? I said, it'll help you endure it till you overcome it. And so grace was helping her all along the way. And God's grace is helping us. But you got to say that. You got to believe that. You got to confess it with your mouth. You got to believe it in your heart. And then you got to have patience. The Bible says in Hebrews, through faith, finish it for me, and patience, we inherit the what? The promise. And so I was sitting there at my desk, and I said, Father, I receive your grace. I receive it in the name of Jesus. This worry that is on me, that is overwhelming me, got my mind twisted. Y'all with me? I can't think about nothing except this dark outcome. And I said to myself, I got to get rid of it. I got to get this off of me. Listen, that's demonic oppression. Did y'all hear me? And if you think you can't get oppressed by the devil, you are crazy. Every last one of us can be oppressed. I didn't say possessed. I said oppressed. Things will come into your life that will cause you, to, but you got to stand against it in the name of Jesus. And you got to declare the grace of God is operating in my life. I have his grace in Jesus' name. Are, are y'all hearing me? And so I was sitting at the desk and I said, now, if I got it and it's mine, then I'm free of this oppression. And then I began to talk to the devil. And I began to remind him of whose I am and the authority that I have to cast him out. Say amen. And to cast the care on him. To cast him out, but to cast the care of the situation on the Lord, for he cares for me. And now, because I got to get my emotions together, I started praising God. Because your emotions got to line up with your confession. So instead of me worrying, I started praising and started giving God my best praise. And it ain't very impressive. Amen. But it's my best. He just said, make a joyful noise. And it was off tune and it was sounding all messed up. But that's all right. God hurt me. And I promise this is not a lie. I'm telling you the truth. As I was praising God, I got a phone call from the very individual that I had care concerning. And they came, hallelujah, with a praise report of how God had intervened 
and delivered them from their dilemma. I said, God, if anything, we have underestimated your grace. I'm not, I'm, I'm telling you what God loves. He loves us to love his grace because it will help us endure it till we can overcome it. Listen, where y'all are, y'all need to stand up and let's give God some praise. Let's give God some and let's rejoice. Give him some praise for his grace today. And let him know thank you for the grace to endure it until I can overcome it. And with that, let the church say amen.